Hey everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pig. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Yes, indeed. Time for another rock and read. Today we'll read chapter 25 and chapter 26 of Iron Man, written by the Rip Master from Black Sabbath, Tony Iommi. Here we go. Paranoid went to number one in the UK album charts, and although it hadn't even been released in America yet, we did feel pressure when we had to come up with our next album, Master of Reality. Because once you've had a number one album, where do you go? If you don't go to number one again, you're not doing as good. So you've got to come up with songs that are going to make the next album at least equally as popular. Management had us out on the road all the time with weird schedules. Sometimes we did two shows a day in different cities. We hardly had any breaks at all. Because of this, and because we didn't have any songs lying around from previous studio sessions, we went into a rehearsal room and started writing them. I'd come up with riffs, and once we got started, we came up with songs quite easily. Sometimes it was a bit of a struggle to get enough for an album, because you needed some time to think about them and live with them. And we didn't have that time especially after Paranoid. If we didn't have enough songs for an album, we'd have to write an extra song in the studio. We'd add little guitar bits to songs as well to extend them a bit. I also like to come up with some instrumental guitar tracks, like Embryo, which serves as an intro to Children of the Grave on the Master of Reality album. It's a little classical thing to give it all a little space and create some light and shade. If you listen to an album or even a song from start to finish, and it's all pounding away, you don't even notice the heaviness of it, because there's no light in between it. And that's why, sometimes in the middle of songs as well, I put a light part in to make the riff sound heavy when it comes back in. Orchid served a similar purpose, leading into War of This World. It was just me on acoustic guitar, a nice little bit of calm before the storm to make the dynamics pop out. At first, everybody thought, hmm, that's a bit odd. But we like doing stuff outside the box. We wouldn't think, you can't do that. You can't do acoustic stuff. You can't use orchestras. So we did much more than heavy stuff. When we recorded Master of Reality in February and March 1971, I got quite involved in it and really started coming up with ideas. We did some stuff that we had never done before. On Children of the Grave, War of This World, and Into the Void, we tuned down three semitones. It was part of an experiment, tuning down together for a bigger, heavier sound. Back then, all the other bands had rhythm guitarists or keyboards, but we made do with guitar, bass guitar, and drums, so we tried to make them sound as fat as possible. Tuning down just seemed to give more depth to it. I think I was the first one to do that. We just weren't afraid to do something unexpected. Like Solitude, maybe the first love song we ever recorded. Ozzy had a delay on his voice, and he sang that quite nice. He has a really good voice for ballads. I'm playing the flute on that song as well. I tried all sorts of things in the course of doing albums, even though I couldn't play them. And after being with Jethro Tull for that short stint, I thought, I might try the flute. I did it only to a very amateurish extent, I must admit. But... I've still got that flute. We all played Sweet Leaf While Stoned, as at that time, we were doing a lot of dope. While I was recording an acoustic guitar bit for one of the other songs, Ozzy brought me a bloody big joint. 
He said, just have a toke on this one. I went, no, no. But I did, and it bloody choked me. I <coughs> coughed my head off. They taped that, and we used it on the beginning of Sweet Leaf. How appropriate, coughing your way into a song about marijuana in the finest vocal performance of my entire career. Into the Void is one of my favorite songs from that lineup. Sabbath Bloody Sabbath is my other one. The structure of those songs is really good because they have lots of different colors. There's lots of different stuff happening in them. Into the Void has this initial riff that changes tempos in the song. I like that. I like something with interesting parts in it. For Ozzy, getting Geezer's lyrics right wouldn't always be easy. He certainly struggled on Into the Void. It has this slow bit, but then the riff where Ozzy comes in is very fast. Ozzy had to sing really rapidly. Rocket engines burning fuel so fast up into the night sky they blast. Quick words like that. Geezer had written all the words out for him. Rocket, what a but a but, what the, I can't sing this. Seeing him try, it was hilarious. Just like our previous albums, Master of Reality had some controversial moments. Sweet Leaf upset some people, and so did After Forever, thanks to Geezer's tongue-in-cheek line, Would you like to see the Pope on the end of a rope? The cover was unusual again as well. This time, it just had words in purple and black on a black background. Slightly Spinal Tappish, only well before Spinal Tap. Although this time, we were allowed two weeks to record the album. What with Roger Bain producing and Tom Allum engineering again, musically, Master of Reality was a continuation of Paranoid. At the time, I thought the sound could have been a bit better. That's the thing when you're a musician. You like things to be a certain way, to sound a certain way, and therefore it's difficult to leave it up to other people. When it goes into somebody else's hands, you've got no control over it, and when you hear it, it's not like you expected it to be. That's why I got involved more and more after those first albums. Well, we're done with chapter 25, so why don't we move on to chapter 26. When we recorded Paranoid, I still lived at home. My parents had bought another place in King's Standing near Birmingham. They planned to move there as soon as they got rid of the shop. Mom wanted to get out of it. It was just a burden. You'd wake up in the morning and the shop opened, and after you closed, you'd go to bed. They could never go away. We never went on a holiday as a family. They had never been abroad. I was proud of that new place. Before they moved in, I had a key, and if I had met a girl, I'd take her up there. This is our new house. After all, I couldn't take anybody back to the old house. Here, come and sit on this box of beans, and I'll get you a nice drink. Wouldn't think of it. But it was time for me to find my own place. At first, I didn't have the money to do that. And when the money came in, I was out on tour all the time. The first big checks went toward a flash car anyway. No sooner did I get my hands on some serious cash than I bought myself a Lamborghini. So here was this Lamborghini outside the house in Inhill Road, King Standing. The house cost 5,000 pounds when they bought it. This thing was like five times more than that. That car outside, we were mad in those days. We were all car crazy. Geezer always said, when I pass my test, I'm going to buy a Rolls Royce. One day I came home and there was this Rolls Royce parked outside our house on Inhill Road. I thought, oh. He's done it. Geezer's passed his driving test. 
Bill also bought a Rolls Royce. In the ownership book, there was Frank Mitchell, the famous Mad Axeman, Sir Ralph Richardson, the well-known actor, and then Bill Ward. He'd have crates of cider in the back of it, like a traveling bar. Ozzy didn't have a driving license, but he still bought my Rolls Royce off me. His wife drove him, and he came over to my house with all his dogs on the back seat. It was an immaculate car when I sold it to him, and the state of it when he came over? Dogs in there and everything. Geezer didn't manage to keep his car in mint condition either. It was the days of platform shoes, and geezers were very, very big. How on earth he drove that car with them? I just don't know. He was driving around Devon, where the hills are quite steep, and he stopped off at a shop that was on top of one of those hills. He parked the car, went in on his platform shoes, and somebody in the shop suddenly said, Look, there's a car rolling down the hill, and it's a Rolls Royce. Geezer went, Oh! He ran out hobbling along on his platform shoes as fast as he could, trying to get next to his car so that he could open the door and stop it. Of course, Geezer couldn't keep up with it, and the car went flying down the hill and crashed through a fence, straight into a tree. On his way home, he drove past my house, and I heard his car go, ksh, ksh, this scraping sound of the fan hitting the radiator. The front was completely smashed up, and Geezer said to me, Now I see why they call it a Rolls Royce. I bought my first house in 1972 in Stafford, north of Birmingham. It was a three-acre property with a swimming pool. I soon noticed that they were building this modern house right behind it, and I thought, it's right behind my swimming pool. Instead of allowing it to bother me, I bought it for my parents. They moved in there from their house in King Standing. It was a lovely place. Brand new, all carpeted, modern bathrooms, the whole lot. I let Dad use some of the land where he could have his chickens, so he quite liked it there. But Mom felt like she was stuck in the middle of nowhere too far away from the city. It was brilliant giving them that first house, but they didn't like it, so that was a huge disappointment to me. I said, okay, you find yourselves a house you do like, and I don't want anything to do with it. You tell me about it, and I'll get it. So they did. They found this house that they liked at an auction. I was in America at the time, so I sent this guy along to bid for the place. And who was he bidding against? My aunt, who was trying to get it as well. I didn't find out till afterwards. It was just the two of them bidding. I couldn't believe it. But we got it in the end, and they were absolutely thrilled to live there. Dad had horses and chickens there, so he was in his element. It was almost too late for him because he was starting to get too ill to enjoy it, but he did have a few good years there. I tried to look after them, but that wasn't easy. Earlier, when we lived in King's Standing, I saw my father outside with this old handle trying to crank start his car, and I thought, oh God, every morning he's out there doing it, cigarette in his mouth, really horrible. We can't have this. So I bought him a Rolls Royce. Mom said, He's not going to like that. Of course he will. I went to this dealership and bought him a Rolls Royce for his birthday. They delivered it to the house with a crate of champagne in the back. Dad just went, What's that? I don't want that. Can you imagine me going to work in that? What would all the people say? And the neighbors... What are they going to think? Me with a Rolls Royce. Bloody hell. I had to phone the Rolls Royce people up and say, He doesn't want it. What do you mean he doesn't want it? It's a Rolls Royce. 
Yes, but he won't even get in it. So they came and picked it up. I said to Dad, What do you want then? I don't want anything. Wouldn't you be better off with another car? What about a Jaguar? Well, it's better than that thing. So I bought him this Jaguar 3.4, the classic one with all the nice wood and switches and stuff. He still didn't want it, but I said, Dad, you gotta have it. I can't get my money back now. I bought this car. They won't just forget about it. I have to buy something off them. He used that for a while, but it was a struggle. I thought, blimey. I try and help him out, and he says, I don't want that bloody thing. My father died in 1982. He was only about 65 years old. Mum survived him by nearly 15 years. He was a stubborn man, very proud, and he never complained. He just plod on. He had worked hard all his life. That's what he believed in. Work and nothing but work. And he would never stop smoking. He smoked himself to death. He died of a collapsed lung and of emphysema. One day, I noticed he was looking ill. Because Sabbath had done some charity work for the hospital in Birmingham, I had met these specialists. I told them about Dad and they said, Well, get him to come in. Dad hated doctors, so I said, There's no way he's coming to the hospital. Would you come out and see him? They did, and he went absolutely mad. He hit the roof going, Don't you ever bring them around here again. They checked him over anyway and said, Well, he's in a bad way. But there was nothing they could do for him. He just wouldn't have it. Couldn't buy him a house. Couldn't buy him a car. Couldn't buy him his health. Well, that wraps up chapter 26. Let me know what you thought of both chapters in the comments below. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.